A special thank you to Chazak for inviting me to share on the all-important subject of Hey Dad, how do I know God spoke to us at Sinai? In a certain sense, it's a very pivotal question because the entire Judaism hangs on the premise that God spoke to an entire nation. So this presentation is actually not mine, I'm the one who's giving it, but the presentation, the contents, actually comes from the Arachim seminar. Arachim, as you might be more familiar through the book of uh, Rabbi Yosef Wall Wallace, um, Incredible, that's the name of the book because it, it is incredible. So he's the CEO of Arachim. Arachim is the largest Kirov organization in the world outside of Chabad. And they're responsible for probably around about half a million Israeli secular Jews becoming religious over the last 40, decade, 40 years. So this presentation is one of quite a few in the Arachim seminar. It's usually known as Encounter at Sinai. And our title is, Hey Dad, how do I know God really spoke to us at Sinai? The information here is very powerful. It's based on a very simple logic. Let's begin. If you're going to start a religion, not you personally, you can make a lot of money by the way, but let's say you know someone who wants to start a religion. Actually, there are really only two options. Option one, God spoke to me last night in front of nobody and said I am his new prophet to give his instructions to mankind. Option number two, God spoke to me in front of witnesses. Now, if you're going to start a religion, which of those two is obviously the superior claim? Okay, number two. Why? Why is witnesses a superior claim? Oh, because you can check it out. So you're not relying on me. You can go and check with the witnesses. It's interesting that in any court of law, Jewish or not, throughout history, the only evidence that counts to substantiate anything as factual is first-hand eyewitnesses. So why would any religion select the inferior claim that God spoke to me in front of nobody. So let's look at these two possibilities because the logic is pretty much fail-safe. That means there's no wiggle room. This logic is 100% ironclad. And that is the following. You cannot make a claim of this magnitude that the Almighty spoke to an entire nation of 3 million plus witnesses. You cannot make this claim unless it happened. Because the moment you say God spoke to me in front of witnesses, fine, produce the witnesses. So let me share with you the, the extension of how this logic really works. It's very simple. We are the only religion. Now that happens to be actually true and all the others are man-made. We're going to look at that in just a few moments. Not a single religion in 3,334 years, 17 days, and, one second, sorry, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 hours and 15 minutes ago, when God spoke to the Jewish people at Sinai, not one religion in the last 3,334 years has made the superior claim that God spoke to me in front of witnesses. Christianity, not a single claim of actual eyewitnesses seeing Jesus coming out of the grave. Muhammad coming down from a mountain, no witnesses. Why don't they at least lie? Just say that there were thousands of what historians call Judeo-Christians. The original Christians weren't Christian, they were Jews. But they believed that this particular rabbi was their messiah. Um, and that's where the word Christ comes from. It's a Greek word which means Messiah. So Christianity actually means Messianism. So why wouldn't they just lie and say there were thousands of thousands and thousands of us at the gravesite of, of Jesus and, and in the middle of the recital of Psalms, uh, suddenly there's an earthquake and the ground begins to tremble and the tombstone splits open, opens up and, uh, and Jesus comes out and says, Rabbi Sai, gentlemen, I'm back. Now, you go home and you tell your family and friends that what you just witnessed, what are they going to say? You're crazy. To which you'll say, well, I'm not the only one. There were thousands of us. Okay, so produce your witnesses. Listen carefully. It's such a simple logic. The minute you say, God spoke to me, or I have a revelation in front of witnesses, you are opening yourself up to be caught in a lie. Because you need all the witnesses to line up with the same story. 
The book of Exodus chapter 12 tells us that 600,000 men came out of Egypt. You add on all their wives, they had at least one each. Well, um, in those days they were allowed more than one. I personally can't afford more than one, but um, that's beside the point. So you got about 1.2 million adults at Sinai. Add on all the children, at least two children per family. So that's 1.2 million children, 1.2 million adults. Do the math. I was never that good at math. I failed so many times I can't even count. So uh, you got 1.2 million children, 1.2 million adults, that's 2.4 million. Add on all the adults, male and female, above the age of 60, you have a conservative number of about 3 million witnesses. So now let's look at the other side of this logic. And I'm going to offer you really two very simple metaphors. Metaphor number one, some of you may recall actually having been at the MetLife Stadium um, this past year, January, when there was about 90,000 religious Jews celebrating what's known as the Siyum Hashas, the completion of another cycle of the Talmud, which takes every seven years approximately. Um, and I'm going to ask you if you were there. And if you were, I'm going to ask you to pretend that in the middle of this incredible celebration, a giant hand with a giant voice comes down and points at you and says, You, yes you, are my chosen prophet to give my instructions to mankind. So you go home and you tell your family and friends, you know what, I always knew I was special, but I, I had no idea. God spoke to me in front of the whole stadium at the Sea of Mashas, the completion of the Talmud. And question, what are your family and friends going to say to you? You're crazy. To which you will then answer, well, actually, there were 89,999 witnesses beside me who saw this event with their own eyes. To which you will then say, oh, that's interesting. I've got a lot of friends who were there, and they're not talking about this revelation. Um, CBS, NBC, ABC, all the national networks, Hamudia, Yated, um, all reported on this uh, huge event, and somehow they all missed out on this um, significant detail. You see, you cannot make a claim of this magnitude unless it happened. Because the moment you say there are witnesses, everyone said, great, produce your witnesses. And that's where you're going to get caught. So isn't that interesting? That in 3,334 years, 17 days, and, okay, so a few more minutes ago, since then, almost every religion we know, on record, has surfaced. How many of them made the superior claim that God spoke to their leader in front of witnesses? Zero. Hmm, interesting. Now let's look at another metaphor which really distinguishes the difference between Judaism and all the other religions. Inverted commas, because there are no other religions. We are the only ones who God actually spoke to. Christianity believes that, and they rely on the event of Mount Sinai, the revelation, national revelation, divine revelation, and so does Islam. They actually rely on it. If you ask any sincere Christian who had a monopoly on the truth one second before uh, Jesus was born, and they'll say, well, the Jews, of course, and any practicing Muslim would have to admit the same. So I'm going to share with you now a very simple metaphor. There's a king. He dies. He leaves behind twins, princes, without instructions as to who should be the next king. So guess what they're doing? Of course, they're fighting. Well, that's until one of them comes up with a brilliant idea. He calls together all the members of his father's royal court. And I'm going to pretend to be that prince and you be in the audience, all the members of my father's royal court. Um, gentlemen, ladies, I have very, very solemn information to share with you. My father, the king, came to me last night in my dream and said, I am the next king. So let me ask you, can you prove to me that I did not experience my father, the king, come to me in my dream? You can't prove me wrong. You can't exactly say, excuse me, dear prince, um, that's not true because I was in the same dream as you and that's not how it happened. So I've obviously selected a claim that's very hard for you to refute. So what's your answer? And the answer is so simple. 
You have to say something like this. Well, you're in America, so you really have to empathize. What a healing experience. We're so happy for you, dear King. They saw your father um, in your dream. That's wonderful. Um, help us to understand something, dear Prince. If your father, the king, wants us to accept you as the next king, whose dream should he be coming in? Well, how come he only turns up in your dream and no one else's? Oh, because it never happened. That's the difference between Judaism and all the other religions. There are no other religions. They're all man-made. Some are made in China. Some are made in India. But essentially, they're all man-made. Oh, so this is the essential logic of national divine revelation at Sinai in the book of Exodus chapter 20, which is, if you want to call it, the foundation of not our belief, but our knowledge, conviction, certainty. As the word emuna, unfortunately, we usually translate it as faith. But seriously speaking, if you look at the, the Hebrew grammar of the word, it comes from the three-letter root amen. Amen means, I agree this is true. So actually, when we are depending on our emuna based on this event, which our sages tell us is the mitzvah of emuna, the command to actually know God exists, is from the words in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, where God introduces himself and says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am your constant power of all powers, Asheherzitiha Me'eretz Misraim, who took you out of Egypt, Mi Beisavadim, and from the house of slaves. So the essence of our religion is an event that was witnessed by millions of people. And in that sense, we are all living testimony of a people who have an unbroken transmission from Sinai till today, 3,334 years later. So at this point, I'm going to share with you another dimension to this. And it's very simple. It's Navua. Navua usually translates as prophecy. There are different elements to prophecy. One of the major ones is the prophet gives information about the future. The prophet is not inventing this, and if he does, that's pretty, that's pretty dangerous, really risky. A Jewish prophet, to be a true prophet, is giving information that God has transmitted to him on several levels. It's really two, but there's lots of subcategories. The two levels are really the following. Number one, Prophecy, to be true and real, has to demonstrate knowledge of the future. Number two, control of the future. Subcategory of control of the future is that prophecy also demonstrates control of nature, the destiny of nations, empires, civilizations. Prophecy, to be true, has to be irrational. It has to make no sense. It has to not be logical for it to be Jewish prophecy. Example, well, you can take any example. Um, for example, Noah, he's told by God, um, if mankind do not repent from their wicked ways, I'm going to bring a flood that's global and will destroy the entire world. Well, that really makes no sense, well, precisely. You see, there's no correlation between behavior of people and a 40-day, 40 40-night 40 flood. Well, that's exactly the point, that the moment rain comes down 40 days, 40 nights, and destroys the whole world, then it's evident that you're forced to conclude there's a power that controls nature. This is a completely, like, I don't know, parenthetical point, but uh, the Gilgamesh Stone in the British Museum, third floor, if you take a flight tonight on British Airways, you might actually get there tomorrow, wear a mask. Social distancing is still in place. Um, so uh, if you go to the third floor there and you'll ask for the Gilgamesh stone, it's also known as tablet number 11 or the flood tablet. It's one of many thousands that was found in Nineveh, which is mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 10. And the Assyrian community, or Assyrian empire rather, um, the library was actually dug up when ancient Nineveh was discovered and excavated. And this, is and this is one of many thousands of fragments, but it's one of the most famous stones in the world because it's called the flood tablet for the simple reason that it has an account of the flood, the way the Torah describes it. You should not be surprised by that because there are over 250 separate cultures that actually mention 
in their early history a global flood. And that should not come as a surprise to you because if you do the math, Noah, who came out of the, the Teva, the, the um, Teva in English does not translate as box, uh, sorry, as, as ship. It's actually a box and it's rectangle. Uh, according to the dimensions and book of Genesis chapter 6, you'll see the dimensions there, it was a rectangle. When, it, when Noah came out of, the, uh, out of the flood, he lived till the year 2006 from creation. So just to give you the context, um, Adam was was um, created 5,781 years BC, um, before COVID. Um, so uh, Noah, he died in the year 2006, and since then he actually witnessed, because he was alive at what's called Migdal Babel. Migdal Babel is in chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, where people, um, their language got split into 70 different languages. Um, and then from then on they were babbling on, that's why it's Babylon. So uh, Noah was alive at that time, 1996. That's the time of the of the the Migdal Babel, and Noah has, dies at 2006. So his children, grandchildren, great grandchildren all knew him. He was still alive. So when now this one people split into 70 nations, each of them, in writing their account of their history, actually have the flood account. And what's interesting that even though there are many variations, every single one of the 250 plus cultures that mention the flood have four elements. There was some sort of vessel, boat, box, um, a family that survived, eight members. There were animals somewhere in the story. And the fourth element, which is most mind boggling, is all agree that the reason the flood was brought about was because of the wickedness of the generation. Now that makes no sense. That's precisely the point. Because Jewish prophecy to be real has to not make sense. Um, Moses warns Pharaoh that the water is going to turn to blood. That makes no sense. Yes, that's prophecy. Because when it does turn to blood, you're forced to conclude, oh, water has no power of its own. It's being powered by some other power. Earth turns to lice. That makes no sense. Well, exactly. That's exactly the point. Um, there's going to be darkness for the Egyptians, complete daylight for the Jews. That's, that makes no sense. Exactly. So you start going through all the 10 plagues and you start realizing each one of them demonstrates a different element within creation that's being powered outside of itself. Wild animals. Well, wild doesn't wild mean out of control? Well, not exactly, because these wild animals only attack the Egyptians, not a single Jew is, a, is scratched. So you start putting this all together and you get the picture that when God stood at Sinai, so to speak, and we were standing at Mount Sinai, and here God introduced himself as Anoichi Hashem Elokecha. Now I'm going to avoid the uh, Christian-based translations, I hope you're not offended, and, and uh, translate it according to uh, the Hebrew, biblical Hebrew. I, I am your constant power of all powers. Elohim means power of all powers. Um, if you want to check it out, you'll see in the Code of Jewish Law, chapter 5 of the book of Erechayim, of Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, um, tells us that the meaning of the word Elohim is powers. And why are we calling God plural? That's the name he gives himself right at the beginning of the Torah, chapter 1, verse 1. Um, and that's because he is the one power behind all powers. So God introduces himself at Sinai, Anochi Hashem Yud Elokecha. I am your constant power of all powers. Do you know how you know that I exist? Because you witnessed my power control every element in creation. Water, earth, wind, blowing the arbe, the grasshoppers from the east to the west and back again. Oh, so the wind was being blown by some other power that was blowing the, the arbe, the, the locust. Oh, chayshech, darkness was being controlled because it was daylight for the Jews, dark for the Egyptians, uh, wild animals, um, water animals, aquatic animals, sephardea, every single element in creation. You have these blocks of ice covered in fire, fire and ice coexisting, well that's part of the miracle, coming down from the skies, destroying everything and everyone in its path. I should translate myself, path. I'm 30 years in America and I get paid to speak with this accent, so please excuse me. Uh, so. When you start adding it all up, people were able to come to the simple conclusion, oh, I get it. There's a power that's powering all these elements in creation. Until finally, one second before midnight, every firstborn in Egypt is alive. One second later, all dead. 
And God tells us at Mount Sinai, you know how you know that I am the power of all powers and I'm the only one? Because you witnessed all the different elements in creation being powered by a different power. I am that power. I am your power of all powers. And the way you know that is you experienced that power controlling everything in creation when I took you out of Egypt. That is the essential premise of Judaism. There's a second dimension which I, I said I'm going to mention and that's prophecy. And within prophecy, we've got hundreds of prophets, prophecies. Um, there are about 21 major prophecies and I'm going to bring to your attention one particular one. And that you'll find in, uh, it's called Parshat Vayitchanan, uh, chapter 4 of the book of Deuteronomy, verse 32, where Moses, who's on the dictate of God, actually says to the Jewish people, and he writes this in the book of Deuteronomy, and um, ki sha'alna, what does sha'al mean? Sha'al means ask. No, it doesn't mean ask, it means ask. Um, na means please. Oh, so listen just to the introduction. Moses writes, I'm begging you to please ask the following question. He's not saying take this on faith. He's not saying um, just listen to me and be a robot and just nod your head like a dog at the back of the car. No, he's saying I want you to ask this question for yourself. I don't care where you are in history, into the future, a thousand years, two thousand, three thousand, three thousand, three hundred, three thousand, three hundred and thirty-four years, seventeen days, and pass on that. I want you to ask this question. Please ask about the days that came before you. How much before you? From the day man was created on earth. That's the sixth day of creation. That's when we actually begin measuring time. We don't measure time from the first day. We measure time from the sixth day. Um, if you say how long you've lived in your house, you're not going to include the couple of years that it took to build it. Uh, you, you count it from when you moved in. Um, we count time from the sixth day of creation because that's when mankind was created through Adam and then Chava, Adam and Eve. Please ask about the days that came before you, how much before you, from the sixth day of creation, beginning of time. Ask this question in time and space, from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe. I'm begging you, ask this question. What's the question? Was there ever anything as great as this? Did you hear anyone else tell you anything as great as this? What's the this? Hashama am kol elokim. Did a nation heard the voice of the power of all powers? Speaking from the midst of the fire, kashe shamata, like you heard. and you survived the occasion. Moses is saying something extraordinary. He's putting it in writing for all future generations to check off. Christian, Islam, Muslims, Zoroastrianism, Baha'i, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, it, it makes no difference who you are, ask this question. Because the, the Bible, Deuteronomy 3,334 years ago, is telling you, you're going to catch me out if I'm telling a lie. But I have full confidence because I'm not writing this myself, says Moses. God told me to write this. Will there ever be an event as great as this, or will you even hear anyone else tell you a great event as great as this? And that is a whole nation listening to the um, uh, a whole nation listening to the voice of Elohim, the power of all powers, like you heard. Oh, so now you have two pieces of logic. Number one, you can't make this claim unless it happened, because the moment you say God spoke to us in front of witnesses, great, produce your witnesses. Oh, that's really hard. And you've got to make sure they're all going to say the same lie. Very hard. And we've got three million witnesses at Sinai. That's a conservative number. Number two logic is we have a Navua. Navua is very dangerous. It's risky. The obvious risk in Navua is if it doesn't come true, you're in hot water. Not just you. The Navi, the actual prophet himself, forget it. He's a Navi Shekhar. He's a false prophet. And if he's saying it in the name of a divine document, goodbye to the document. If he's saying it in the name of a, a divine dictate, that dictated the document, everything's at risk. 
And Moses, 3,334 years, no one's asking him to write this. I beg you, he says, ask, was there ever another event as great as this? So these are the two pieces of very powerful logic that is the premise of our Amunah. I'm not going to translate it as faith, that's a Christian-based translation. Um, we do need faith, and we can't live without it, the, but the starting point is an event that we witnessed. The question that we're now going to look at, and it's a, it's a kind of obvious question, um, well that's all very well for the witnesses who were there, but you and I, like 3,334 years later, uh, were not there. Um, so. How do you make this huge leap from an event that took place thousands of years ago and now impose on me that I also have to accept it as fact? So, to address this, we're going to change the subject. Um, not to avoid or deny, I'm going to change the subject to a completely different subject. But I'm going to ask you, as we switch to another topic, watch in your mind's eye a parallel between the event that took place 3,000 years ago and one that's relatively much more recent. So, a quick show of hands, I will not count you, I just want to ask you please to raise your hand in answer to the following question. How many of you really believe the Holocaust happened? So, I'm glad to see that uh, all of you put your hands up, but here's a slightly different question. How do you know? How many of you know it really happened? And if you're putting your hand up, please, what's your evidence that the Holocaust really happened? You're talking about an event that took place barely 70 plus years ago. How do you know it happened? And you're going to answer, well, your grandmother was, was a Holocaust survivor. Um, maybe you had grandparents who actually died in the Holocaust. Um, and your grandparents had a tattoo of the number on their arm. Some of you might say, well, you've gone on uh, Project Masora uh, trips and visited Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Dachau. Um, because a number of the camps are, are still there. Some of you might say, well, there's mass graves. Others will say, well, look, besides tens of thousands of, of um, survivors, happens to be there are many thousands of GIs of, amongst the Allies who liberated the camps, and they, they actually took movies of uh, cinema, whatever you want to call it, of, of um, that liberation. Even the Nazis, you may argue, um, which is true, also documented their horrendous crimes in William Shearer's book on the rise and fall of the Third Reich. It's about 2,000 pages. Took me just under two years to read. Hmm, not a very fast reader. And this is pre-Harry Potter, so I really wasn't into reading that much. But um, it's interesting that he makes the claim that the Pentagon retrieved paperwork that the Nazis had failed to destroy because they tried to get rid of a lot of the evidence. But there are seven tons of paperwork in the Pentagon relating to the crimes against the Jews during the Holocaust. So the perpetrators of the crime are not even denying it. So you've got, you add up all this evidence, you've got witnesses, eyewitnesses, survivors, you've got the actual uh, members of the American army and the Russian army, British army, who were the allies in liberating the camps. You have documentation and you have movies, you also have um, a lot of artifacts which uh, are actually on display in, in a number of these either Holocaust museums around the world or actually in the, the camps that have been uh, prov prov uh, sustained uh, since that time, in the last few decades. But here's the question, and it's a really important question to ask. That's all very nice because right now there are still a few witnesses who were there, alive. But let's pretend we're 20 years into the future and your grandchildren, not will they believe, this is the question, how will they know? How will they know the Holocaust really happened? And if you show them, well, look at these photos, look at these clips that the Nazis took, what are you, what's your grandson going to say? Oh, give me a break. I can, I can reproduce that on Photoshop. Now, I'm not sure if they'll have Photoshop in 20 years from now, but um, am I exaggerating that your five-year-old who can barely read, um, and certainly not an instruction manual, of a complicated software program is able to figure it out by himself and actually manipulate on Photoshop a picture that is not real. 
And it used to be, in my generation at least, there was an expression which today is a complete, utter laugh. And that expression was, the camera never lies. <laughs> very funny. Well, actually, that was a very serious comment because there was no, have a minute, there was no thought that you could mess with the photography of a camera that actually shot this picture. So your children are going to take the picture seriously and if you show them the camps, they'll say, well, that's just a veritable movie set. And actually, please forgive me, I don't mean to uh, be controversial in saying this, but uh, Auschwitz, for example, the barbed wire there is not the original barbed wire. Um, uh, most of the wood has been replaced and it's renovated in such a way to look like it's old. The bricks are still there, but uh, much of it is constantly being updated and in doing so they're also making it look like it's 60, 70 years old. So uh, the guide that I went with when, when I went on one of those trips actually said it's a veritable movie set. because. It's, not, it's a reconstruction for the most part. So your kids are not going to accept that as evidence. Well, you can't produce the witnesses. They, they're all dead. So the, why should your grandchild not just believe, but know the Holocaust really happened? So this is a very similar question. I'm asking you in your mind to watch the parallel. Here's an event, Mount Sinai, 3,000 years ago. Here's an event, the Holocaust, barely 70 plus years ago. So um, watch the parallel as we build the case for understanding how we know the Holocaust really happened. The question is actually stronger because if there's anyone going to surface who's going to make the claim that the Holocaust did not happen or that it was an exaggeration, not that many Jews actually were killed, um, would you expect to hear that from the intellectuals and academics? of society, professors, or more likely from like lower classes, that's an English expression by the way, um, who've got a, a grind, to, a, an axe to grind uh, with the Jews. So interestingly, um, forgive me for even quoting, um, Austin J. App, no, that's not an App, that's his last name, uh, former associate professor of English at LaSalle College, Philadelphia, is the author of numerous neo-Nazi pamphlets. One, for example, entitled, Did Six Million Really Die? The Truth at Last. Arthur Butts, professor of engineering at Northwestern University and author of The Hoax of the 20th Century. He denies the death camps ever existed and he denies the extermination of millions of Jews. He claims the Holocaust is a fabrication made by Jews seeking to enlist support for Israel by appealing to popular guilt feelings. Robert Farrison holds a PhD from the Sorbonne in Paris. He was dismissed from his position as professor of French at the Lyon University for revisionist views and convicted by a French court for defaming the victims of the Holocaust. He claims the Nazis, he claims the Nazi gas chambers never existed and the facts about the Holocaust and the number of victims have been grossly exaggerated. So, I'm quoting from professors 35 years ago. This is way in the generation of the survivors themselves, right in their faces. They're making this denial. These, these are academics, intellectuals. Where's their logic? What's their psychology for coming up with this nonsense? And the answer, please forgive me, is really taken right out of the words of their mentor, who wrote in Mein Kampf, in a Bavarian jail in 1924. Hitler, Ihr wrote the following, the magnitude of a lie always contains a certain factor of credibility. And in view of the primitive simplicity of the minds of the masses, they more easily fall victim to a big lie than a small one. The receptivity of the masses is very limited and their intelligence is small, but their power of forgetting is enormous. In consequence of these facts, all effective propaganda must be limited to a very few points and must harp on these in slogans until the last member of the public understands what you want them to understand by your slogan. This was the predicate of the Nazi propaganda machine. If you tell a lie enough times, and it goes on for years and years and years, eventually you got Yeshua Mirim, some say it did happen, Yeshua some say it didn't happen. I have a brother-in-law in England who 
uh, made very strong attempts to stop the British government from a law that they passed anyway. And that is, you c you're not allowed to teach Holocaust studies in high school uh, for the simple reason that it's offensive to those who believe that it never happened, and especially to the Muslim community, which has a tremendous influence now in Europe and, and England, um, who are part of uh, this denial. So it's only a matter of time before a lie which is perpetuated and repeated in books, in university history reference books, it's only a matter of time before your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, are going to say, how do I know? Some say it did happen, some say it didn't. No survivors. So what's the evidence? You hear, I'm just helping you see that the question is really serious. It's a very serious question. So now I'm going to suggest how we can build a model to ensure the memory of the Holocaust. So let's take all the survivors who are still alive, duh, and make a club. We'll call it the Holocaust Survivors Club. You know, we're going to bring all the survivors to Jerusalem. And there we'll have a special ceremony. We'll ask them over probably a matter of days, weeks, months maybe, that while they're in Jerusalem, we're going to ask them to please commit to writing, each one of them, their personal account of their experiences in the war years. The Holocaust, cattle trucks, the ghettos, Buchenwald, Dachau, Treblinka, Auschwitz. And we'll collate all of their written testimony into one large document. Let's call it the scroll. And once we've put this all together, we're going to have a closing date by which no one is allowed to come and say, oh, I've got a new testimony uh, to add to the scroll. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's a closing date. We don't want anyone coming later on saying he's got a new testimony about an event that's already been recorded. So, um, all clubs have rules. So, let's have some rules for the Holocaust Survivors Club. One rule might be every single child born to a Holocaust survivor, grandchild, great-grandchild, must wear on the outermost garment a Star of David. And when people say, uh, what's this yellow star on your jacket, your overcoat? And they say, oh, this reminds me that I'm a member of the Holocaust Survivors Club. Um, my great-grandmother perished in the camps. Um, my grandmother was um, born during the war. Or, um, and, and this reminds me that I'm a member of the Holocaust Survivors Club. Oh, okay. And let's have another rule. Maybe for the boys, let's say, after they're born, I'll say about, for argument's sake, let's say on the eighth day after they're born, we're going to tattoo on their left arm the same number that their grandfather perished with in the gas chambers, or their grandmother survived after the war. And we'll, wh whichever member of the family, um, we will replicate that exact same number and it will be tattooed onto the arm of every child, grandchild, born into the Holocaust Survivors Club. Watch the parallel. Um, let's have another rule. You know what? Um, let's, let's take this document called the scroll and divide it into weekly portions. And you know what we'll do? Um, every, let's say, I don't know, Saturday morning, for example, um, wherever there are Holocaust survivors, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, we will come together every Saturday morning and we'll read that weekly portion of the scroll of the Holocaust. And we'll make festive meals, like starting Friday night, and Saturday afternoon, we'll have festive meals whereby we'll talk about that weekly portion and we'll have an exchange discussion with the parents, grandparents, if they're still alive, with the children. And the children will be asked questions about that weekly text. And sometimes it might even happen that grandpa, who was a survivor, is at one of those uh, Saturday meals and says, well, actually, those words, even though they are accurate, but let me tell you what's between the lines. And he starts giving you tons of information that's not even in the scroll. And you say, but grandpa, um, that's not what's written. I said, no, no, no. Do you think we could write it all? It was impossible. These are headlines. What's written are headlines. But there's a whole oral transmission of information that is fills in all the details. Oh, interesting. You know what? Let's let's 
select from this document, the scroll, one paragraph that fits the criteria of summarizing the purpose of the Holocaust Survivors Club, which of course is to perpetuate the memory of the Holocaust. So you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll take out one paragraph and it might read something like this. We'll read it every morning, every evening, uh, before we go to sleep, when we wake up in the morning. It might read something like this. Hear, O Israel, listen, and never forget the Holocaust happened to us. And you shall remember the Holocaust with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these rules which you're committing should be on your mind and talk of them when you go to sleep at night and you talk to your children in your home, when you wake up in the morning, when you go on a journey, talk about these rules and write them in black boxes and pin these boxes or strap them to your arm and your head uh, when you recite these paragraphs every morning of your life and write them on the doorposts of your home so you remember the Holocaust all the days of your life. And you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll take this, this paragraph and we'll, we'll duplicate many parchments, just make it special, um, with special ink perhaps, and we'll roll up that parchment and we'll pin it on the doorpost of every home of a Holocaust survivor, child of a Holocaust survivor, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, wherever they live, Paris, Melbourne, Sydney, New York, London, uh, Manchester, uh, Philadelphia, Monsey, wherever, it doesn't make a difference where. And, and we'll, we'll wear these black boxes with the paragraphs folded up, uh, rolled into, into these little black boxes on our arm and on our head. Watch the parallel. You know what, every club has anniversaries. So um, what anniversaries could we have for the Holocaust Survivors Club? Well, let's have an anniversary from, for when we first came together as a club. Oh, okay, so to commemorate that special time that we became a club in Jerusalem, do you know what we'll do? We're going to select that part of the scroll that um, describes that event. And we're going to stay up all night reading that part of the story where we came together as Holocaust survivors in order to perpetuate the memory of the Holocaust. And that will be our first anniversary. Second anniversary, Let's celebrate um, the liberation from the camps. Um, now this one's going to be a bit more serious. It's like a seven day event. And to commemorate it, on the first night of this celebration, uh, Grandpa, the patriarch of the family, will sit at the head of the table and he'll take potato peel and dip it in puddle water. And he'll hold it up for everyone in the family, children, grandchildren, cousins, etc., to see. And he'll say, this is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate when they were slaves to the Third Reich. And were it not for the Allies who liberated us from the camps, we would either still be there or we would have been totally destroyed by the Nazis. And we'll eat this uh, food for seven days to remember those difficult times and how grateful we are to the Allies who liberated us and took us out of... You know what? I think we should have a third anniversary. Um, but it's going to commemorate a period of Holocaust history that is not so well talked about. And that is the years 1945 through 1948. Tens of thousands of Jews wandering through Eastern Europe without the necessary paperwork to substantiate entering within the quota that Britain allowed, or Australia, or even America. Um, and they were wandering, stateless, trying to find the right papers, get in within the quota until 1948. And the United Nations voted that the state of Israel should be established. And we had a homeland to go to. So to remember those very painful years of being homeless, stateless, and looking from place to place to see if we could restart our lives, we're going to spend seven days camping in our backyard in a temporary dwelling, like tents, to remember those years of wandering through Eastern Europe. Watch the parallel. 
I'm going to take one more rule. There are actually 613 rules in the Holocaust Survivors Club, but I'm just going to, I'm not even going to talk about the details. <laughs> the small print. Whoa. Um, I'm just going to mention one more rule. And it's, this is the most sensitive, probably, rule that you're going to hear. And that is, what do you do with new members? So a new member comes and says, um, I would like to become a member of the Holocaust Survivors Club. So you say, fine. Um, which member of your family was a, a survivor? I said, None. So, oh, so you, don't need to, you don't need to join us because this is not a club that has a stronger position because of its numbers. This is not a club of numbers. This is a club of reality. We are here testifying to an event that we know took place. Because my grandfather, I heard the stories from his mouth. And I have the same tattoo on my arm as my grandfather. And my father has the same tattoo. And we wear this. So, so we're going to reject that offer that he wants to join our club or she wants to join a club. But you know what? If they keep coming back, we'll set up a panel and screen their sincerity and commitment. And if they really, really want to, we'll let them in. But quite frankly, we're not looking to beef up the numbers because it's really not a numbers game. Our position is not strengthened by numbers. Our position is already strong for the fact that it's factual. It's simply reality. This is an event and we are witnesses that our parents were there. Or we are witnesses that our parents' parents were there. So we are witnesses that our parents were witnesses that their parents were witnesses. Watch the parallel. Actually, in all frankness, there really was a Holocaust Survivors Club that was established in um, a period of, in June 1981. And I'm going to read to you from Ernest Michel, who was the chairman of, of that event. It was called the World Gathering of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. And Ernest Michel, the chairman of the World Gathering, made the following speech, I quote verbatim. My name is Ernest Michel, Auschwitz number 104995. Like many of you, I had a dream that one day, if we live, we could come and stand together. This is a reunion of a special group of people. We want to stand together once more before time runs out, united in freedom as we were in slavery. We want to see in each other's eyes and in the eyes of our children the proof of our survival and the joy that comes from being alive and free. But there's more than that. We survivors want to tell those that try to rewrite history and deny the Holocaust ever happened. Our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our nostrils were filled with the acrid fumes from the gas chambers drifting over our camp day after day, week after week, year after year. These hands have carried more corpses than I care to remember. So don't tell us it never happened. We were there. This gathering could not have taken place 10 or 20 years ago. It took time for wounds to heal enough for us to meet. This is why this event took almost 40 years to come into being. And that is why we shall never meet as one group again. It has become fashionable to invoke the memory of the Holocaust. So much has been written, so much has been dramatized. It was we who lived it. We who survived it. We of whom they write. We of whom they speak. So today, it is our turn. Today, we speak. Despite the memories of the past, we have built new lives for ourselves. Many of us have <clears throat> second families, so many of the first were exterminated. We have children, we have grandchildren. We have sanctified the names of those we lost. We have contributed to Jewish tomorrows. People ask, why are you doing this? Why do you want to meet? Why recall a past such as you've had? Our response? Straight and simple. We survived for a purpose. Already something constructive has emerged from this gathering. We've represented here are almost 1,000 members of the second generation. And I am pleased to announce they have formed in Jerusalem a second generation international network whose major purpose will be to carry on the memory 
of the Holocaust. He concludes, this was the evening of the future, the transmission of the legacy. And at the closing ceremony at the Western Wall, 10,000 people sat in perfect silence while a short legacy was read by a survivor in six languages, Hebrew, Yiddish, English, French, Ladino and Russian. And a child or grandchild of a survivor received the legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully to the logic. Mount Sinai, 3,300 years ago. Holocaust, barely over 70 years ago. How would you know the Holocaust really happened? Well, if we would have a system of transmission, of rules, structure, anniversaries, so you can understand how generations into the future would still be holding on to the memory of the Holocaust. Let me share with you. Ben Gurion, was he known to be a deep lover of traditional Judaism? <laughs> Not at all. He was the proud founder of the State of Israel and the educational system minus God. And when Ben Gurion is invited to the Anglo American Investigation Committee of the United Nations in 1948, prior to the vote whether or not the leaders of the world should vote for the Jewish people having their own homeland, they invited him to give the most compelling argument for why they should vote in favor of the Jews going back to their land. Let me share with you verbatim the quote from Ben Gurion's speech. What did he come up with? About 300 years ago, a ship set sail for the New World, and its name was the Mayflower. Its, passion, its passengers were Englishmen who had become disgusted with their government and their society. They set out in search for some deserted shore to establish a new life for themselves. They landed in America, and they were the first founders of that land and that people. This was an important event in the history of both England and America, and for this reason, to this day, Every American child knows of the Mayflower, the Pilgrims, Plymouth Rock, and November 25th, Thanksgiving Day. I am, however, very interested in knowing if any Englishman, or American for that matter, is aware of the hour and the day the Mayflower set sail. Does any child know, or even adult, how many pilgrims were there on this historical voyage? What were their names? What were the names of their families? What did they wear? What did they eat? Where did they get water to drink? Uh, what, how did they navigate the route? And what happened on their trek? Behold, it was more than 3,300 years ago that the Jews set out from Egypt. Every Jewish child all over the world, in America, Soviet Russia, Yemen, Germany, knows exactly how his ancestors left at dawn on the 15th of Nisan. What did they wear? Ben Gurion quotes Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. Their loins were girded, their sandals were on their feet, their staffs were in their hands. They ate matzah and arrived at the Red Sea after a seven-day journey. These children also know the route their ancestors traveled and what events transpired during their 40-year trek in the wilderness. They, are, they ate man and quail. They drank water from the well of Miriam. They arrived at the borders of the Promised Land on the banks of the Jordan River facing Jericho. And they know the names of their ancestors and can quote them to you from the five books of Moses concludes Ben-Gurion. Till this day, Jews the world over eat the same matzah for seven days, starting on the 15th of Nisan, every year. And they relate the story of the Exodus and the tribulations that the Jews have suffered from the day they left their land and wandered into exile. And they end by declaring two phrases that children, parents, and grandparents have been saying for thousands of years. Now we are slaves. Next year we will be free men. Now we are in exile. 
Next year, we will be in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel. This is the nature of the Jews. End of quote. Ben-Gurion, not a lover of traditional Judaism, could not come up with a more compelling claim for why the Jews deserve to have their own homeland other than unbroken transmission from the original event, the Exodus, till today, same Passover, same Tefillin, same Matzah, same Shabbat rituals, oh, same Kashrut, same Lulav, same Mezuzah, same Tzitzit, same ritual baths, Mikvah. Ben Gurion himself admits that this is the nature, of the, this is our DNA. We have been loyal for thousands of years to the same rituals commemorating an event you cannot fake unless it happened. Because you're talking about three million witnesses standing at Sinai and listening to God say, I am your constant power of all powers. And you know how you know? You witnessed my powers take you out of Egypt. So I'm going to conclude now that I don't think Ben-Gurion fully appreciated the power of his own argument. I'll explain. You see, if you were sitting on the lap of your grandfather and the year is 2488 from creation, it's 40 years since you came out of Egypt and your grandchild, you were born in the desert and you're sitting on your grandpa's lap and it's the first Passover in the land of Israel. We just crossed over the Jordan, we're about to conquer Jericho, and your grandfather and your father has the first time mitzvah, command in the Torah, chapter 16, book of Exodus, which tells us, V'higadel vincha, sorry, chapter 13, V'higadel vincha, you shall tell your child, by Yomahu, on that day, referring to Passover, Ba'avuzeh, because of this, the paschal lamb, Korban Pesach, the matzah, and the maro, the bitter herbs. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the great almighty God, took us out of Egypt. So you're getting in the midst of what's called Haggadah, Magid, to tell the story of the Exodus. So you're listening to your grandfather and he's telling you, I was a bricklayer like my father before me. I'll never forget the first time my father failed to fill the quota of bricks. The Egyptian slave masters took his younger son, Chaim, two years old, and cemented him alive in the walls of the storehouses that we were building. I'll never forget, three days later, his only daughter, Princess, went missing. And we knew exactly where to go because hundreds of Jewish children were kidnapped off the streets in Goshen every day. And my father was permitted entry into the innermost chamber of Pharaoh where he and other Jews were allowed to see their children's throats slit open to provide the daily blood baths for Pharaoh. Do you know how I know? I was there. I was there when suddenly there's a big commotion. I say, hey, what's going on? Why isn't everyone working? I say, oh, didn't you hear? Someone by the name of Moshe ben Amram uh, has just arrived from Midian and claims to be the Moshean Shal Yisrael, the savior of the Jewish people. And he says that God has spoken to him and, and, and made him the prophet who's going to take us out. And this is the final salvation that we've been praying for for a long time. And sure enough, um, the Zikanim, the elders, who know that he has to have a password, it was two words, Paco Yivkait. And Indeed, he provided those two words and they checked with the only person still alive who heard that that was the password from her uncle Yosef Atzadik and her grandfather Yaakov Avinu, Jacob the patriarch, and that was Serach Bas Asher, Serach the daughter of Asher. And she confirmed, yeah, this is the right password. I was there when the water turned to blood. I was there when the earth turned to lice. I was there when the wild animals attacked the Egyptians. I was there when the, the animals were moaning and groaning from the, from the deva, from the plague. I was there when the Barad, 
these huge rocks about twice the size of your head, made of ice on the inside, fire on the outside, came down with their kind of own GPS system, God's positioning system, and knocked off a whole limb of, a, an, of, of the Mitzri, of an Egyptian. I was there when the Arbe, the locust came. I was there when it was dark for the Egyptians, light for the Jews. I was there at the death of the firstborn. I was there during the Exodus. I was there at the splitting of the sea. And I was there when God spoke to us at Sinai. I was there at the golden calf. Do you know how I know? Because I was there. I was there at the construction of the tabernacle, the Mishkan. I was there when Korach had a whole rebellion and got sucked into the ground. And I was there when the Miraglim, the spies, came back from checking out the land of Israel and said, Lashon Hara. They denigrated the gift God gave us of the land of Israel. I was 19 years old as a slave in Egypt, and today I'm, four, I'm 59, 40 years later. I survived the wilderness, and now I get the mitzvah, the commandment, instruction to teach my children and grandchildren about the story of the Exodus. Now, let me ask you, you were sitting on your grandfather's lap, but when your grandfather dies, and you become a mother, a grandmother, a father, a grandfather. What story will you be telling your children every single night, first night of Passover every year? Oh, you'll be sharing the eyewitness account you heard from the mouth of the survivor, the people who are actually there. You see, and when you pass on, your children will be saying the same story. Until our sages formulated the Haggadah and put it in writing, and we've been doing that for 2,000 years. In the Geniza of Cairo, which today is actually in Cambridge, uh, you'll see the oldest Haggadah in the world is 1,100 years old. It's called the, the Cairo Haggadah. I actually own a replica of the Bartanur Haggadah, which is 800 years old. My father, Alam Shalom, bought it for me. And it's actually uh, published by the British Museum. You see, you and I, we've been keeping the same rituals, same mitzvah, same tefillin of the anniversaries of coming out of Egypt, standing at Sinai, Shavuos. So I don't know if Ben Gurion fully appreciated the extent to which we Jews have been persecuted, persecuted and exiled. And we're all over the world keeping the same Torah, same mitzvahs for 3,334 years. And here is where I end. If you take the definition of a generation, really it's around about, well, if you took a Torah definition, it's really 70 or 80 years, that's what King David says. But take a really conservative number of 50 years. So you have a 50-year-old, it's very likely he's married and may even have children. And many 50-year-olds even have grandchildren. So I'm taking 50 as a one generation, even though it's very likely you're going to have an overlap of father, 50 years old, with children, and maybe even grandchildren. So it's actually an overlap of three generations, but I'm just going to pretend for argument's sake, we're dealing with one generation. So 50 years is one generation. Question, simple math, how many 50s in 100? Two. Good. How many 50s in 1,000 years? 20. How many 50s in 2,000 years? 40. How many 50s in 3,000 years? 60. How many 50s in 300 years? Six. Do you realize you only need 66 generations from the original event of Sinai? So that means if you lined up 66 people, each one of them are 50 years old, you're 50 years, you're 50 years, you're 50 years, you're 50 years, you only need 66 people to transmit an event that you can't fake unless it happened. Because you've got 3 million witnesses. That's the power of our Masura, of our transmission. And here's where I truly conclude. Let's put Sinai over here in a court of law. And the Holocaust on this side of the same court of law. And you be the jury. Listen to the evidence. We're going to cross-examine two people over here. A man and a woman. She covers her hair. She dresses um, modestly. She keeps family purity. Lights candles on Shabbat. And you say, mm, what's the origin of these rituals that you practice and the way you live and dress? Oh, this is how my mother lived. This is how my mother lit candles. This is how my mother kept the Sabbath. Um, this is um, what, what my grandmother did. 
and I'm a witness to my parents living this way. I'm a, my parents are witnesses to their parents living this way. And on the other side of the court, you have this young man and young woman. He's got this yellow star on his outermost garment, and, and the um, attorneys are cross-examining. What, what's this yellow star on your outermost garment? They say, oh, this is a reminder that I'm a member of the Holocaust Survivors Club because my great-great-great-great-grandmother perished in the camps. Oh, and what's this number here on your arm? Tattooed? Oh, this is to remind me of the same number that my mother had on her arm, which is the same number tattooed on her mother, etc., all the way back to her great-grandmother who perished in the gas chambers. And you go through all these rituals. Why do you read this paragraph? Why do you study this scroll? And I'm going to ask you, do you think that this young man and woman wearing the yellow star and with a tattoo are the product of a lie, an event, the magnitude of the Holocaust? You think that's a fabrication and they somehow bought into a, an incredible lie? And it's not only them, it's, it's Holocaust survivors all around the world? And on this side of the court, you've got Jews who are keeping the same Torah, same mitzvah, same lulav, same sukkah, same matzah, same mezuzah, same tzitzit, same shabbos, same kashras, kosher laws. And they are witnesses to their parents living this way. Their parents, their parents, their parents, going all the way back to the original event, which you cannot fake. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the evidence for how we know what we know. You are the jury. You've heard the evidence. And the verdict is your choice. Thank you.